Um, so I'm going to hand it off now to Graham to help uh, you know, walk us through why we approach this problem through the lens of magic. How do I move forward? Oh, uh, no, this one. this one. OK. Thank you, Arvind. So I'm, uh, let me, oh, yeah, OK. So I'm an anthropologist here at MIT. Um, and I'm a linguistic anthropologist who studies human communication. Most of my research uh, thus far has been on magic. And I've written a couple books about how magicians communicate through performance. Um, those books were based on a couple years of field work in the magic community in Paris. Uh, this is me before I came to MIT, before I had any gray hair. Uh, wow. Uh, studying, doing field work, and learning magic alongside a group of French magicians. Now, I was surprised uh, in, during the pandemic to find myself wrapped up in this project on um, data visualization and counter visualizations of people contesting orthodox ideas about uh, the course of the pandemic using publicly available data. But as, you know, once we published that piece and the dust kind of settled, Arvind and I started to have kind of a longer and more protracted conversation about what it meant. And one of the things that struck me, and in fact, it's surprised, I don't want to put you in an uncomfortable position, but I was surprised that Arvind was as surprised as he was by the adversarial readings that people were making of orthodox um, scientific claims. And so we started to talk a bit more about the contested reception of visualizations and data representations that to us seemed authoritative and credible. Why were people approaching them from an adversarial standpoint? And as we talked through this, I found myself I initially saw no connection to magic whatsoever, but I found myself little, little by little um, kind of thinking back to my work with magicians and drawing on things that I had learned from magicians. Because as you can see in this picture, this is one of the magicians that I worked with, Marie Odile. Um, look at the way the spectators are looking at her hands. American magicians would call that burning. When a spectator looks so closely at the magician's hands trying to figure out what they're doing. Magicians approach every performance as an instance of adversarial communication. Not because um, audiences are hostile or don't want to be entertained, but precisely because audiences always know before the performance begins that the magician is going to deceive them. And not just deceive them by showing them an illusion that fools their eyes, but deceive them by manipulating them with words and logic in a way that will lead them to draw false inferences, to make false conclusions. And so one of the things that I had seen magicians do is to think very carefully about everything they said and did, every gesture, every sign, every word, um, and always approach every performance thinking first and foremost of the, of the spectator's perspective on what they do in the context of adversarial communication. So this is one of my magic teachers on the right here, Nemo, who's teaching a card trick to my friend Isabel. And this is two instances in, the, in a sequence of um, transmission of this trick. Here he's showing her what the spectator is supposed to see. And here he's showing her what the magician is actually doing. So they're constantly moving back and forth in their mind, in their minds and in their conversations between the audience what the audience is going to experience or might experience or might think and what they actually do. And all of their performance is crafted to produce the um, perceptual, experiential, or narrative outcome that they want. They want the 
audience to come away from a trick with a story in their head. And everything needs to lead to that story. So talking to Arvind uh, about this, I realized that magicians actually had a lot of insight into the situated nature of human communication and the way that people kind of phenomenologically construct experience in interactions. And so I started to think, I don't want to just be telling Arvind what, what magicians would think about data visualizations. I actually wanted to bring some magicians to engage with the kind of data visualization research um, going on here at MIT so we could kind of um, make catalytic, hopefully, and transformative connections, maybe cross-pollinating between um, computer science and magic, which is ultimately what uh, led to Jeanette um, being here. But I think that the, com the connections between computer science and magic counterintuitively might run even a bit deeper. This is another scene from my field work um, where you can see two magicians. He's actually a computer scientist. Um, two uh, magicians exchanging uh, technique for making a coin disappear. And magic, as I experienced it in the field, is very much a technical and technological um, practice where the performers and practitioners are constantly devoted to refining, advancing, researching, studying, and developing new techniques. This, goes, this tradition, many would say, goes back to the 19th century French magician Jean-Eugène Robert-Houdin, who's often referred to as the father of modern magic. Now, I don't know if any of you are magic historians. There's some contestation about his legacy as the founding father, as there always are in these kinds of Oedipal dramas. Um, but I would argue that the reason that he has gone down in history as this kind of founding figure is that he was the first one to introduce to magic the idea of progress, the idea that magic is a technical domain that it advances technologically and scientifically in lockstep with other advances in human knowledge. Um, and he thought that the magician should showcase that technological and scientific advance in their performances. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like, one of the great tricks that Robert Houdin introduced to the Western stage is a levitation effect um, called the ethereal levitation. And what he would do, he introduced this in 1847, was levitate his son on this rod that was balanced on this platform. So you see it's a, it's a pretty cool effect, but it's not a perfect levitation. He's not levitated off the ground. But the way he framed this effect was amazing. Whoa, I get weird acoustics here. It must be that. Um, the way he framed this effect, ether had just been discovered. And he told the audience, so people knew that there was this new scientific breakthrough. And he had a hot pail behind the stage. And he had one of his assistants pour ether onto it so the smell would diffuse through the air. And then he, ga he would say, I'm going to gas my son. And he would ex you know, pretend to expose him to ether and said, it actually makes the human body lighter. And he would levitate him in that way. So 150 years later, David Copperfield introduced his flying effect. And this was one in which the magician could fly in three dimensions with no visible strings or connections. So clearly, there is a kind of platonic ideal of what a levitation is. And technologically, the advances over 150 years have led magicians to coming closer to actually realizing that platonic ideal. Robert Dunn was also a technologist who was renowned throughout Europe for his clock making and automata building. And he was also a scientist. He invented one of the first devices for looking inside the human eye and painted this picture of his own retina. Um, so all that to say that deep in the history of magic, there's this connection with science and technology that makes our collaboration a kind of logical extension of a relationship in the past. 
But also, as I've learned more about computer science, I realize that there's a magical history to computer science, too. Um, programming is commonly analogized to doing magic. In the, uh, in the uh, jargon file, a dictionary of programming slang from hackers slang in, 19, in the early 80s, there are entries for magic, deep magic, black magic, heavy wizardry, voodoo programming, incantation, and casting runes. All of these things being um, Ma uh, jargon related to abstraction, obscurity, or black boxing. And in Alan Turing's uh, 1938 uh, dissertation from Princeton University, he introduces the concept of an oracle, which is often referred to as a magic oracle, and its operation is explained using the phrase as if by magic. So just as science and technology have this history in magic, uh, computer science also has this interesting en entanglement with magic. And we began our proposal by referring to Arthur C. Clarke's um, famous quip that any form of sufficiently advanced mat well, I always get Technology. it backwards. Technology is a form of magic. I always think the opposite is true, too. <laughs> any sufficiently advanced form of technology uh, is magic.